So uh, before we get started, let me remind uh, Comsing seniors in physics to make sure that you get a hold of the sign-in sheet and get yourself signed in before you head out. Uh, once the talk ends, I'll also remind folks that uh, Ryan and I will want to chat some more with the speaker, so if the general audience can make their way out uh, after the talk, that would be great. And uh, so today we have uh, Charlie Hall here uh, to give the talk. Charlie uh, has been an active member in the physics department in all sorts of ways, including uh, on our diversity and inclusivity uh, idea team. He's uh, done some research in quantum materials, and uh, when he's not doing physics, he enjoys playing soccer. Uh, but today, he's going to tell us about physics of audition and coherent points. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Jay. Um, as he said, uh, the title of my presentation is The Physics of Audition and Cochlear Complex. Um, so first of all, audition is uh, the sense of hearing. Um, and hearing is one of the two primary ways in which we receive information from the environment around us. Uh, the other way being uh, the optical system, so through vision. Uh, and so, uh, when someone's uh, vision is impaired, uh, uh, the solution is to wear glasses, which is something that um, is pretty well known to people and pretty well understood. Um, but what about when uh, you have hearing loss? Uh, so today, I'm going to describe the auditory system, and then I'll talk about the cochlear implant, which is um, one uh, device that can help uh, restore hearing. And so uh, the cochlear implant is a prosthetic. Um, so what does that mean? That means it, um, it uh, uh, replaces or serves the function of uh, missing or damaged body part. And so in this case, it functions uh, as the same way parts of the ear uh, do. And it's interesting because it's the only device that can functionally restore a sense that has been lost. So, um, and I say functionally, um, and so I'll get to that. Uh, I'll elaborate on that later. But uh, part, part of this is because uh, from what you'll learn today, the auditory system is really, uh, really incredible. And so the task that the cochlear implant has to try to replicate what the ear is doing um, is a, a really difficult task. Um, and so in this talk, I'll uh, go through um, uh, the auditory system um, uh, through a physics, looking at it through a physics lens. And so I'll talk about some of the cool, interesting physical um, concepts that are going on when you are um, uh, hearing and interpreting sound. And then, and then I'll talk about um, the cochlear implant a little bit um, and what it does to mimic uh, this uh, system. Oh, so, um, so first I should remind you uh, what sound exactly is, since that's uh, what the auditory system is sensing. And so sound is a wave, and a wave is a disturbance that transfers energy. Um, sound uh, can be thought of as a pressure wave, specifically, um, which is caused by vibrations of vibrating an object. Um, so here, the vibration of the, um, the membrane of a speaker. And so that vibration will push on that air molecule next to it and compress them. Um, and then those will, it'll start a chain reaction and those will compress the, push on the particles next to them and those will push the particles next to them. And so it'll be propagating this uh, state of being compressed or state of having high pressure will be propagated through a medium. Uh, when it's disturbed. And so the most um, basic waveform is um, a, harmo a harmonic wave, uh, which means it's periodic, and so it's a sinusoid. And so uh, a basic sound wave can be thought of as a sinusoid where the amplitude is uh, the 
the magnitude of, of pressure uh, at a certain point. And uh, back to the auditory system, um, even for the loudest sounds humans can tolerate, the change in air pressure between wave um, crest and trunk is only one in 10,000 of uh, the normal air pressure. And so um, this tells you that the human, air, the human ear is incredibly se sensitive to pressure changes um, in the environment. And so uh, uh, talking about the ear anatomy generally, um, uh, what happens is sound comes in from the environment and travels through the ear canal and the vibrations in the particles pushes on the eardrum which causes it to oscillate. Uh, the vibration of the eardrum will be passed through these three bones and those vibrations will be pressed into uh, the, the liquid filled cochlea and cause pressure waves in the fluid of the cochlea and the cochlea is where um, these pressure waves are turned into electrical impulses that the brain will interpret as sound coming in the ear. Um, and so I'll note that the ear is typically grouped into three parts, the external, the middle, and the inner ear. And so first, um, I'll talk about the middle ear actually. And so uh, a good question that might come up is, so what's the, what's the point of the middle ear? You have these three little bones in there. These are actually the tiniest, uh, the smallest bones in the body. Um, and it seems like, and when I say middle ear, I say this structure of the eardrum and the three ossicles, and then this, which is, a, the eardrum's a membrane, and then the whole window is also a membrane. And so it's, all it is doing is transferring vibrations from one membrane to another. So why isn't the cochlea just like the entrance of the cochlea determined by the uh, eardrum? That's a good question. Um, and so, this actually has to do um, with the, the medium that the sound is traveling through on either side. So on one side, the sound is traveling through air, and on the other side, it has to travel through this, uh, this fluid. Um, and so if you were, let's say we ignore the middle ear um, and model this as um, an air fluid interface that's separated by the eardrum, uh, what would happen? And so we sound, we send in this sound wave, and some of it will be transmitted, and some will be reflected. Um, and uh, a common air fluid interface is uh, a body of water. And actually, so what happens at an air water inter interface is 99.9% .9 of the incident sound energy is reflected, uh, uh, which is, of course, terribly inefficient. And so uh, this, if this were the case too, this would be terribly inefficient for the, the human ear. And so um, this actually explains too why it's, um, if you've um, run your own experiments when swimming and tried to talk to someone else underwater, um, the human voice sounds really muffled. And so it's, it's because um, uh, your vocal cords are vibrating air um, and causing air to vibrate, and then once it hits the the water or tries to uh, hits the water, 99.9% uh, .9 of that energy is reflected, and so you're only hearing a, a fraction of, of that sound. Uh, and so this is something that this man is learning the hard way. <laughs> but uh, this is due to an impedance mismatch, and I'll I'll describe what this means, and I'll talk about it more. Uh, but first of all, so what am I, what am I talking about here with impedance? Um, I'm talking about acoustic impedance, and that's defined as um, the amount that the volume velocity changes give with, the, with a given pressure in the medium. And the acoustic impedance is a property of the matter that the, the sound is traveling through. Um, a, a, an easier way to understand it is Electrical impedance is something that uh, physics majors will be uh, uh, familiar with, and acoustic impedance is analogous to electrical impedance. Uh, of course, where uh, electrical impedance is the resistive, 
components of a circuit, of, a, of an AC circuit. And so it has a resistive part, an erective part, um, and acoustic impedance is the same way. Um, and so here's Ohm's law for an AC circuit, um, which we have a good grasp of. The, the, the definition of acoustic impedance is analogous to this. Uh, the voltage and the pressure are both like the driving uh, the energy, and then uh, the impedance is resisting it. Um, and so we have a good grasp of what um, current is, of course, it's the, the flow of electrons. Uh, but what is this volume velocity? Well, it's defined as the volume of um, uh, particles that flow through a cross-sectional area um, over a given time period. So, or also the, the velocity of that cross-sectional area. Um, and so it can be thought of as a flow rate or the flow of the fluid. And so, okay, back to, uh, now that we have those definitions, back to uh, the interface uh, where we're considering uh, uh, ignoring the middle here. And so earlier, fluid one was, was air, and fluid two was this cochlear fluid. Uh, but I'm gonna, let's uh, look at this generally and figure out how much of the sound, incident sound intensity is transmitted at the interface of these two fluids. And I'll note that um, in this case, uh, the two fluids are gonna be separated by a lymph membrane of negligible mass. Um, and similar to how the eardrum is separated into two fluids, this is just gonna function to basically hold the two fluids apart. Uh, and um, I did say originally that, um, consider this to be air, uh, a fluid can be any um, uh, liquid or gas. So anything that has particles that, that flow uh, freely. And so, again, we're gonna have this incident uh, sound wave coming in, and then a transmitted uh, component and a reflected component. Uh, so the, to uh, solve for the amount of incident sound intensity that's going to make it through, uh, we're gonna have to consider the boundary conditions. And so, uh, so the first thing that's going on at this boundary is um, since the membrane is, is limp, uh, it will not uh, be resisting any, or resisting or dissipate any force that's pressed upon it. And so uh, any pressure that is being imposed on a point of the, of the membrane from fluid one, there'll be an, an equal and opposite, or an equal force or pressure on the other side uh, pushed back by fluid two. Uh, so there's a continuity of pressure. Uh, the other boundary condition is uh, this no slip condition. Um, and the easiest way to think about this is um, at the, the boundary of a fluid uh, that's static, that's uh, uh, not moving, um, any particle um, that is touching uh, in contact with that surface is also not moving. And so they're moving at the same velocity. And so uh, this also holds um, as long as there's no mass flow across the membrane, uh, which this membrane is, 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 is keeping the fluids apart, so there's no mass flow. And so the velocity on one side will equal the velocity on the other side. And so uh, plugging in our uh, definition of acoustic impedance, um, we can get the following ratios. Um, but what, what we actually wanted was uh, the ratio of the sound intensity, and so the sound intensity is defined as uh, the power of the sound wave over a given area. And so uh, this, another definition of the intensity can be uh, written in terms of the acoustic impedance and the, the flow, the fluid velocity. And so uh, in order to determine the probabilities of transmission and reflection, we're going to take the um, ratio of uh, intensity that's trans 
transmitted and divide that by the intensity of the incident sound wave. Um, and we, we come to these two equations that depend on the impedances of the two uh, fluids. Um, and if uh, people that, physics majors that have taken quantum mechanics may, may recognize our, these equations or, or think they, they look familiar, and as well as the, these ideas of the probabilities of transmission and reflection, and that's because we've seen it before in, uh, in one-dimensional scattering. And so, uh, as a quick aside, uh, uh, we're introduced in quantum to one-dimensional scattering through uh, the potential step. And so that's, uh, uh, so how it goes is we send in an infinite uh, wave of a certain energy towards a potential step, and which is um, a discontinuity in the potential. So on, on one side, the potential is zero, and on, on, the, on the other side at this point, uh, we have a potential of uh, B, B naught. And, um, and sending in this incident wave, we look at, uh, we calculated the probability of transmission and the probability of reflection. And so if you do this, the calculations, you come to these results here, which you'll notice are of the same form uh, of what we just calculated, which is pretty cool. Uh, and so in, in this case, the trans, uh, transmission and reflection is dependent on the relative values of the energy and the potential. Uh, so, so the physics underlying uh, these two uh, cases are, are different, but it's, uh, it's pretty cool that we see the same results in both cases, or the same, or same form. And so uh, back to our fluid dynamics result, uh, we can rewrite the probabilities with uh, Q, which, is, uh, which means that uh, the probability of trans uh, transmission and reflection is dependent on the, the relative values of the impedances of the two uh, fluids. Uh, so if we think about this, uh, uh, some general cases about uh, these equations. So when, uh, so when uh, the impedance of the second fluid is much larger than the impedance of the first, Q will go to zero, and we'll have uh, all of the sound and intensity being reflected. And if we look at the opposite case where the impedance of the first fluid is much greater than the impedance of the second fluid, um, and Q goes to infinity, we'll have the same, same thing. So everything is reflected. However, if the two impedances are, are equal, then we'll have all of the sound intensity transmitted. Uh, and so when, this is uh, what is meant by impedance matching. So when two mediums are impedance matched, transmission of sound energy is most efficient. Uh, and at in extreme impedance mismatching, uh, sound is not transmitted. And so in general, practically, sound can only be transmitted from one medium to another. Uh, if only if their uh, impedances are similar. And so, uh, if you want to know how much of the instant sound intensity will make it to the cochlea, if there were no middle ear, uh, again, using our general result that we just uh, uh, derived, uh, the acoustic impedance of air is 420. And this is an experimentally determined uh, value for the impedance of the cochlear fluid. Uh, using these numbers, less than 3% of the incident sound intensity is transmitted to the cochlea if there were no middle ear in this case. So that is very inefficient. And knowing, uh, in general, in like biology, like natural systems have evolved to where they're very, very efficient, so this is would not be the case. And so what the middle ear does is it seeks to match the impedance of the cochlear fluid in, in order to effectively transmit sound to the cochlea. Um, so how does it do it? It acts as what we call 
in the impedance transformer. And people might be familiar with this from um, an impedance transformer from electronics, or um, and uh, to play this analogy more, uh, any uh, source, uh, uh, AC source, will have an internal impedance, and we know that the circuit will be most efficient um, if the impedance of the load is equal to the impedance of the source. And so, um, in, in a similar way, um, impedances of two different components of the circuit may be matched by a, adding in an impedance transformer, which would be some combination of uh, resistors, uh, inductors, um, capacitors. And so, uh, the middle here is acting as an impedance transformer. And how does it do it? We want to increase the impedance. And so the first way it does this is by concentrating the force uh, pressed on the, the eardrum into an, a membrane of smaller area. So that's decreasing the area, which will increase the impedance. And the second way is this lever action of the, the ossicles, these bones. Um, the malus and, and incus will have a, a pivot here. Um, and so through the uh, lever action, this will increase the, uh, the force and uh, decrease the velocity at which uh, this point is traveling relative to uh, that point. And so from first principles, um, from the definition of pressure, uh, we can determine that uh, the, uh, the ratio of the relative values of the pressure depends on the relative uh, areas of the two um, membranes, and then for the lever action, uh, starting with Newton's second for angular motion, um, we can uh, derive this uh, lever action equation, and then and also if we look at uh, the uh, r times the angular uh, velocity is equal to velocity, uh, the linear velocity, uh, we can say that uh, and substituting the length of the bones in for the radius of the, of the levers, we can determine that the force, uh, the, the ratio of the forces and the ratio of the velocities um, at the ends of the levers are, are uh, equal to the ratio of the length of these bones. And so, uh, from our impedance, we can we can determine that the transformer ratio depends on the, the the ratio of the areas of the two membranes and the difference the ratio of the two lengths of the, the ossicles. And so, um, plugging in numbers for this, the, the eardrum is 17 times larger uh, than the whole window area, and the malus is 1.3 times length of the ingot, we can calculate, uh, we can estimate that the transformer ratio um, is 29, uh, 29. And so that means that uh, this impedance transformer will take the impedance of air hitting at the, at the eardrum and increase that 29 times before it reaches the oval window. Um, and so uh, if we multiply the impedance of air by 29, and calculate this again, we get that 57% of the incident sound um, is transmitted into the cochlea uh, with this middle ear transformer, as opposed to the 3% that would happen if we didn't have that. And so, um, and this is a, a, a low, like a, a low estimate too. A lot of sources um, put this at two thirds. Um, or both. So uh, the middle ear does play a, a big role. So that's uh, pretty interesting. Didn't know that. Uh, okay, so to review. So sounds coming in uh, through the ear canal, causing uh, vibrations to be passed along the ossicles and into uh, pressure waves in the fluid of the cochlea. Um, okay, so what happens next? So the cochlea is uh, this bony structure that 
is actually similar to, to like a, a snail shell or like a seashell, like a spiral. Um, and for our purposes, um, it'll be easier to visualize the cochlea if it was unraveled. And uh, so if it was, yeah, unrolled and so it's straight. And so here I have uh, uh, the ossicles, here's the, the stapes, the, the third bone that's pressing into the oval window at the entrance of the cochlea. And it's causing the pressure waves that will run through the cochlea. The pressure waves will, here will run along the length uh, of that figure. And so what we're particularly interested in is the basilar membrane. Um, and so that's, um, in this simplified version of the cochlea, the basilar membrane is this blue, uh, blue line there. It can be thought of as the structure that, a structure that is dividing uh, or separating the interior of the cochlea into two fluid uh, compartments, or uh, two fluid filled compartments. And so, um, if uh, pressure waves, when pressure waves are in, uh, incident or are enter the cochlea, um, if the two en ends of the basilar membrane were, were fixed, you might imagine that it its motion it, that it would move in, in, uh, in with nodes, kind of like a standing wave, like if a, a string was fixed on both ends. Uh, but what actually happens is the far end is is uh, free to move, and so uh, the motion is more complicated than that. And so um, uh, for, for, uh, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to model the, uh, that, the motion of the basilar membrane. And so um, some, uh, it's important that um, we have a good sense of how the basilar membrane is shaped, and believe it or not, um, a good way to understand this is if we think about the basilar membrane as a, a flipper. <laughs> so, um, and I have to give credit to Julia Strand on this ingenious idea, but this is how she describes it. Um, she's a psychology professor here. But uh, if we think about the basilar membrane, we can think about it as a flipper that's fixed at the round window. Um, and so, just like a, Flipper would be, uh, it has a thick, if we call the round window zero position, uh, the thickness of the basilar membrane uh, will decrease as position increases. And then uh, the width of uh, the basilar membrane uh, will increase as position um, increases. And then the third uh, quantity that we're looking at is stiffness. Okay, which um, is basically the, the spring con can be thought of as the spring constant of a, a mass on a spring, um, and um, except I'm uh, in this case, as position increases, the stiffness of the basilar membrane um, is decreasing, and so it's not a spring constant; it's it's a function of position, and so kind of like a flipper, the uh, one end will be stiffer, and then the far end will be floppier. And uh, this actually uh, is really important uh, to describing uh, the motion and the uh, like the function of the auditory system. Um, so the motion of the basilar membrane can be modeled as a series of linearly uncoupled damped driven harmonic oscillators. Um, what does this mean? Uh, so we can think about each individual point along the basilar membrane as a harmonic oscillator, which is kind of like a mass on a spring, uh, and they're uncoupled, so each point will be uh, oscillating independently, like independently of, yeah, like of uh, the points adjacent to it on the membrane. Um, and so um, this is the equation of motion for a damped-driven harmonic oscillator. Uh, it would be familiar from classical mechanics. Um, and it can be recognized as 
starting from June 2nd of uh, Mass on a Spring, which relating uh, the position and the acceleration, um, and then adding in a linear drag component with damping constant C, uh, a driving force with magnitude F naught and frequency uh, omega F, and um, in our case, we're making this change. Uh, stiffness will will be a function instead of the spring constant here. The stiffness will be a function that increases as position increases. Um, and so this can be uh, solved to find an equation for the amplitude of displacement. And if we ma uh, maximize this, so take the derivative of the amplitude with respect to frequency and uh, set it equal to zero and solve, uh, uh, we get this. You can uh, trust me on this, or you can work this out when your next class gets boring. But what we have here is uh, the amplitude of oscillation is maximized when the uh, basilar membrane is, is driven with um, a force at uh, a frequency which is equal to this resonance frequency. Um, and we see that um, as we move along the basilar membrane, the position increases from the oval window, uh, the stiffness will decrease, and this will mean that the resonant frequency is decreasing. Uh, if we think about this, we flip that around. Uh, uh, if, if these are modeled as individual harmonic oscillators, uh, each oscillator has its own uh, characteristic frequency at which uh, a max amplitude will occur. And, uh, and so uh, you can think about if uh, a lower frequency uh, sound comes in, a point further along than the baseline membrane will have a will resonate or have a, a max amplitude, um, and if it's a higher frequency sound, then uh, an earlier section of the baseline membrane will resonate and have a max amplitude. Um, and you can think about this um, for the whole continuum of the baseline membrane. And so, uh, um, yeah, and this is called the tonotopic behavior of. Uh, Basilar membrane. Um, I'll come back to this, but um, it's important to also know, uh, understand how the cochlea uh, sends electrical signals to the brain. Um, and so here again, we have our unraveled cochlear with the basilar membrane laid out. Here I have the same thing. Uh, higher frequencies resonate uh, closer to the base, and lower frequencies resonate closer to the apex. Um, and so the key here in turning this uh, um, motion of the basilar membrane into an electrical signal it are these hair cells uh, which line the cochlea. And so the hair cells are the sensory cells of the auditory system and they convert uh, uh, being compressed by the basilar membrane into an electrical signal. Uh, and so uh, simply, uh, you can see here, uh, normally, uh, when the system is at rest, uh, it looks like this. The basilar membrane is below, and the hair cells are in between the basilar membrane and the fixed membrane. And then when the basilar membrane uh, ha has a, when the amplitude, uh, when it has an amplitude in a certain spot, it'll compress these hair cells, and that will trigger electrical signals. Um, and so, um, if you think about a specific hair cell at a specific point in the basilar membrane, um, if the basilar membrane uh, is, had, uh, has, uh, moved, has moved there and is compressing the hair cells, then that specific part, uh, hair cell, will stimulate uh, electrical signals to the brain, and your brain will. Uh, know that the frequency of uh, the sound that you just heard is wherever the electrical signal was strongest. Um, and so, uh, just as an, uh, a, a brief overview of how electrical signaling works in the cochlea, 
Nerves communicate in electrical signals of individual nerve pulses, not in uh, with, uh, complex waveforms. And so uh, it, it signals in discontinuous pulses. Um, so this will be important for how the cochlear, uh, cochlear implant um, has to function. Um, and these pulses are uh, all or nothing, which means that they have pretty much the same magnitude and duration. And so the, the strength of the signal is actually conveyed by the average rate of pulses uh, produced at a time. Um, and again, this information will be important to how the cochlear implant will have to mimic uh, what's going on here. Um, so to recap, uh, the auditory system from a uh, uh, physics lens, uh, sound comes in and causes vibration in the, that are passed through the middle of the ear and into the cochlea and uh, creating pressure waves in the fluid of the cochlea, uh, which cause uh, resonance um, at a certain point in, uh, along the basilar membrane. If the sound is a, a low frequency, um, it'll resonate, cause resonance at a point further along the basilar membrane, which will trigger hair cells in this region to send uh, electrical signals to the brain. Um, and if the wave has a higher frequency, it'll uh, cause um, signal, uh, electrical signals from hair cells um, uh, closer to the oval window of the cochlea. Um, and so your brain will understand that this is um, sound of a higher frequency. And so again, uh, this uh, describes the tonotopic behavior of how the cochlear works, how the auditory system works. Um, yeah. And so in real life, sounds are more complex than I was just uh, explaining. But um, thanks to the uh, Fourier series and Fourier, Fourier analysis, uh, we can think about complex waves as being a sum of um, individual components of sine waves of uh, single frequencies with certain amplitudes. Um, and so, if we understand how the ear responds to individual frequencies, we can envision how it responds to more complex sounds. Um, multiple areas of the basilar membrane will be uh, activated simultaneously for a complex sound. Uh, and of course, just a note, uh, Perception is different than sensation, so um, a lot of uh, what you actually uh, hear or like comprehend uh, from the auditory system has to do with the brain, uh, and so not every not all the sound that goes into the, your ear is actually what you um, are are like consciously um, uh, like feeling or experiencing. Uh, but that's, of course, beyond the scope of this talk. Um, and a lot of that is not understood. Um, but now that we know how the, the auditory system functions normally, um, I can talk about hearing loss uh, or damage to um, the auditory system. And so the, there are two main kinds. The first is conductive hearing loss. And so this is uh, when there is damage uh, to uh, something in, in the middle ear, which is causing, uh, which is uh, uh, like impeding the, the passage of vibrations to the cochlea. Um, and so in a lot of cases, this can be um, uh, helped uh, through surgery. And so that's what uh, people do. Uh, but a more permanent hearing loss is sensory neural. And so this is, uh, this happens due to hair cell damage. And so I have this cool scanning electron uh, microscope image of a cochlea. Um, so on the left is a normal healthy cochlea. And you can see, uh, these right here are hair cells. You can see normally uh, hair cells line the, the, the whole spiral of the cochlea. Um, but for this uh, cochlea with noise damage, there's a section here with hair cells missing. And so 
uh, that could be a, uh, that person's auditory system won't be able to say, hear sounds in this frequency uh, because of how the, the cochlea works. And so uh, this hair cell damage, uh, you, can, you can see why it occurs here, here healthily. Uh, these are stereo cilia, uh, or a part of the hair cell. Uh, and help. normally they're in uniform rows, but upon uh, really loud noises, frequent loud noises, uh, these hair cell, parts of the hair cells have been crushed and eventually they degenerate. They're not getting used. Um, and so that's what's caused this gap in cochlea. Um, and so if you have sensory neural uh, hearing loss, uh, well, first of all, it's, it's, a, it's a normal uh, normal thing over the course of uh, human life, but also it can be worsened due to accidents or uh, injuries of the sort. Um, so the, but the first thing, the first option you would go to is a hearing aid. But what a hearing aid does is it, uh, it takes in the incident sound and then amplifies it um, into your ear uh, to help uh, the, the hair cells that you do have uh, that are still living uh, to help them have more of a, uh, a higher like intensity signal. Uh, so it's um, so it's like making use of the hair cells you have left, but when you when the sensory neural neural damage is severe enough, uh, the best option is a cochlear implant. Um, and so, how does a cochlear implant work? So, what it does is it has to mimic the function of the ear, particularly the basilar membrane and the hair cells. And so, of course, it's cochlear is in the name, so I have to do something with the cochlea. Um, and so. Here's the same schematic I have of the, the cochlea. And so I have said that hair cells um, are damaged in sensory neural hearing loss. And so uh, there will be parts of the cochlea where you can't, uh, the mechanical uh, movements of the basal membrane can't be turned into uh, electrical signals. So instead, uh, your uh, sensory cells are stimulated with electrodes that are inserted into your uh, your cochlea, um, and, and so here's a cartoon of what it would actually look like: uh, an electrode array that runs through part of the cochlea, just for fun. This is this is uh, this is uh, two competing uh, makers of cochlear implants. Uh, what the lecture array looks like. Um, and you may ask, how do we get from an exterior sound to an electrical signal stimulating this electrode array? Um, so I'll briefly go through the components of a cochlear implant um, uh, to explain this. So, so first, uh, sound from the environment will be picked up by microphones. They'll probably have usually have multiple microphones, one on the front, like one on the back to pick up sounds from different directions. Um, and then uh, a microphone converts uh, sound um, pressure waves into an ele electrical signal. And so that electrical signal is sent uh, through the sound processor, uh, which will turn this electrical signal into uh, something that will stimulate the electrodes in order, a signal that will stimulate the ele electrodes in order to uh, uh, send a signal to the brain that they will comprehend as, it will comprehend as sound. Uh, and I'll go more into that uh, after this. But uh, this electrical signal then sent, um, is turned into a radio frequency and it's transmitted across the skin and uh, Goal into an implanted uh, receiver that, uh, and so then it'll run through the stimulator, which will turn the radio frequency back into an electrical signal, um, and this will travel to uh, through the uh, middle ear and through the into the cochlea and uh, stimulate the electrodes. Uh, and so, as I described before. Uh, 
the electrode ray is really something that, that makes this device distinct. Um, but another, another, the other really important part is the sound processor. Um, and so uh, it's behind the ear, so you can't really see in this uh, image. So here's another, so the sound processor is this part behind the ear. And uh, here I'll describe um, an overview of a certain signal processing strategy. And so I say, uh, like, there, there, there are lots of different processing strategies um, out there. And so this is an example of one way that the cochlear implant might work. Um, so here's uh, what the, the microphone has picked up. This uh, signal will be sent through bandpass filters, um, which are basically a combination of the low pass and the high pass filter. So it'll filter the signal to a certain uh, frequency range. And so here, four uh, channels are, are shown, but it'll actually be 22. Um, and so it'll have 22 different frequency bands that will correspond to the 22 different electrodes that are will be implanted in the cochlea. Um, and yeah, 22 is a pretty standard number, it seems. Um, and uh, from, from here, the, the envelope of the signal in a channel will be uh, taken out, which is basically like the outline of the amplitude. And this will be used to uh, modulate uh, or to, to create a, a signal of pulses, basically. Um, and so uh, uh, a couple things to note. Uh, only one electrode is stimulated at a time while others are kept in an open circuit um, in order to prevent a signal going to the wrong part of the cochlea because then you wouldn't be able to interpret the sound correctly. Um, and then also this discontinuous electrical signal uh, is able to give the perception of a continuous sound signal uh, because it, that's how uh, uh, electrical signals work in the body and in the ear. Uh, and so you may ask how effective is the cochlear implant? Uh, so here um, is a result, a frequency spectra uh, that will show the resolution of, uh, this is a complete frequency spectrum versus something, a frequency spectra that would be produced by a cochlear implant for the same sound. Um, and you can see here on the y-axis is the electrode number, um, so it's it's, it's showing what, uh, how each uh, electrode is being stimulated. You'll see that uh, the general shape of the sound, uh, they act it actually does a pretty good job, um, but the resolution is, really can't compare. You'll see just the, the small details, uh, the cochlear implant just won't, won't pick those up. And so um, the sound resolution is, uh, really limited by the number of electrodes, the number of channels. Um, and, but this is limited by um, uh, how the cochlea is. Like it's, it's a really delicate structure and so they can only insert the array so far and, and that's why I, I only show electrodes on the, on the early part of the cochlea. And then also if you have uh, electrodes too close together, then again, you could risk um, something where to malfunction, or you could risk uh, signals uh, that would stimulate electrodes that nearby, and uh, and that would not be that be incoherent sound. Uh, and so uh, you'll see the, the sound resolution comparison. This is what I mean by by functionally restoring hearing. Uh, the purpose of the cochlear implant is, is to allow the person to, to, uh, to, like, un to hear uh, human speech um, and, and so to be able to communicate with, with people. Um, and so uh, this has been the focus of it. And so using these sound, sound cues and along with 
uh, help of other Jews. Most people with cochlear implants are able to like hold conversations again, but a lot of the other uh, uh, sounds uh, will will suffer because of this. Um, and so, uh, something interesting is uh, cochlear implants are currently indicated for about two million people in the U.S. But in this 20-year window, from 20, 2000 to 2019, only 100,000 total follicular implants were implanted uh, in that population. And so, uh, why is this? This is because the cochlear implant, um, it's not a really popular device. It's like, uh, and a lot of that is down to um, what I was just saying, how the sensation of sound is very different than what you're accustomed to. And so, a lot of times, um, it's more effective uh, for people that uh, lose their hearing earlier or were born deaf, and so because they don't have the same uh, memory of sound before. Uh, and then also, there's a bit of uncertainty to the outcome because it doesn't work for everyone. What it does is the brain has to rewire itself to 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 make sense of the electrical signals um, because it's in discrete areas of the cochlea and not like a continuous. Um, and so it takes people's brains different times, uh, amounts of times to get used to it and it doesn't always work. And so people don't always um, uh, go on to keep using the implant. And so uh, there's a lot of interesting implications here that I'd be happy to talk about another time. I don't have time now. But uh, I hope you come away from this talk with um, an eye for the physical concepts that govern your everyday life. Uh, this is uh, an auditory system. It's probably not something that you would expect to be a physics pumps talk, but, uh, but there were actually, um, like when I looked into it, there were a lot of uh, really cool uh, physics ideas that, that make the auditory, the auditory system work. Um, and then also if you come away with an appreciation appreciation for the complexity of the human auditory system. Uh, and it's been about 60 years since the first cochlear implant was uh, implanted. And in that time of research, the auditory system still uh, can't, can't even become close, come, come close to you by the technology. Um, of course, I hope you have an awareness of hearing loss. Um, it's not something to ignore, but also a holistic view on scientific advancements. The cochlear implant is it's a really cool device and like there's some cool physics concepts behind it, but it's really important to like see how it actually um, affects the patient holistically. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you all for coming today. Thanks for your support over uh, years. And yeah, thanks to Jay and Dasha. to like 
that's evolved to be most sensitive to like the human voice range. And so that's due to what resonates in the ear canal, like uh, stuff like that. Yeah. Go ahead, Ian. Um, so would it be, so for future directions for cochlear implants, is it essentially like more electrodes and smaller electrodes and that'll be the main things that improve it or is there, is, are there other things that are like more attainable to improve cochlear implants? Yeah. No, I was meaning to mention that. As kind of like the, I, I kind of talked about the, the limitations to the electrodes, kind of like the, the limitations of how far you can insert into the cochlea. Um, I think in general, the hard, like the hardware is kind of, they're kind of at its limit. So actually the signal processing is um, where a lot of the like research and innovation is coming from now. And so, right, so it's, uh, Yes, if you were able to have, you know, more electrodes, that would also help. But I don't know if that's how possible that, that is. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Good. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that cochlear implants mostly focus on like translating human sound communication. Is there a way to like make a cochlear implant, or are there cochlear implants that like, translate music and like different um, tones outside of the human voice frequency. Yeah. So this yeah, so there's there's a lot of interesting like options of this. So uh, the cochlear implant is like known as being really bad for music. Uh, so especially musicians have a really hard time. And like if you were a musician that would probably be a, you'd probably be at risk for hearing loss in the first place. But uh, it does a really poor job of uh, like signaling music just because there's all of these uh, music is all about like timing and like um, uh, all these different harmonics and stuff and like the cochlear implant will focus on like the specific uh, frequencies that human speech um, is which is like a little bit lower on the frequency so it'll miss out on some of those higher har harmonics which help make music sound better. Uh, so yeah, I don't think uh, they found a way, or like, I don't know if they're even really looking into that, because I'm not sure if that's possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good job. Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, I have two questions. First, if you don't hear like your ears, is it ever possible to like regrow them, you know? That hair. Yeah, like the hair in your face. So, no, so uh, a lot of people too. I, I mentioned how only a certain portion of the people that have been recommended for cochlear implants have actually gotten them implanted. Uh, a lot of research is going on with hair cell regeneration. Like you might have heard of that. Um, so, some people are waiting on that. I read that that's a long ways away from happening. Uh, I did read when you have like mild damage to hair cells, like the, the stereocilia on top are, are damaged, uh, those uh, uh, can, uh, if it's mild, then those can kind of repair themselves. But like the hair cells themselves, uh, Ooh, yes. no. And so, yeah. Okay, yeah, and I have another question. So in the beginning, when you were talking about like the middle of your membrane, uh, you were comparing it to an electrical circuit, yeah. and uh, from like you know the basic like water circuit analogy, I remember that they model a capacitor as a membrane between like in the hose that like pushes a pressure wave and like extends the membrane, which keeps it pushing, so it's like as if it's limited, and that's like how a capacitor works. Is there any like uh, maybe, <clears throat> is there any use to that analogy here? Like, do they use the capacitance of the, like, the So, um, as I kind of mentioned, so like, similar to electrical regions, I know that mediums uh, will have, like, a uh, reactive component, component like, uh, the impedance, uh, uh, which includes, like, uh, capacitive parts and inductive parts. So I don't, honestly, 
I don't know exactly how that, that works, but uh, there's probably something to that. Yeah. Well, let's take one more from Barry and then we'll... Um, so, when you're talking about the base, base loader membrane, mm -hmm. you, you described it as a sequence of uncoupled oscillators. Yeah. And I totally get why, practically speaking, treating it as uncoupled oscillators is sure. a lot easier to solve yeah. the problem. Is there, um, but I'm wondering, like, is there a, a physical justification for calling them uncoupled? Because when I think of one long membrane, it feels like you know, everybody's still touching each other. Is it really high dampening or something like that? Uh, there's probably, um, yeah, there probably would be a, um, a better way for me to explain it. But the, the source I used for that was a pretty recent source. So I, and uh, people have been trying to model that based on memory. I think it's just a, a complicated system. And so, um, like you said, I, don't, I think it, the uncoupled uh, system helps describe the like, frequency dependence of it. Um, so maybe it's more, it explains that behavior than like actually how it you know, physically works. Sure. Okay, okay uh, we need to extract the sign-in sheet. Um, okay, good. All right, let's thank Charlie again.